this is the 400th year since the first slaves were came, were brought, were stolen, brought here to America, and we still, we're still wrestling. 149 years ago, it was placed in our Constitution that no one, no state, nobody could have a right to deny or abridge the right to vote, and we're still wrestling. 1965, the Voting Rights Act was passed. I was two years old, and we're still wrestling. But in a democracy, voting rights is not about are you on the left, or are you on the right? It should not be about whether you're a liberal or a conservative, whatever those terms mean, or whether or not you're a Republican or Democrat or an independent. One person, one vote is essential to what it means to be a democracy. I wanted to start tonight with some words that are not my own, but some words we need to hear so that we have some context about this fight. It was 1957, just three years after the Brown decision. We don't talk about it much, and Martin Luther King was a part of a prayer pilgrimage to Washington, D.C. As he stood there on the mall, dressed in a black robe, the last of the speakers that day, he said these words. May 17th, 1954, decision came as a joyous daybreak to end the long night of human captivity. It came as a great beacon of light of hope to millions of disinherited people throughout the world who had dared only to dream of freedom. Unfortunately, this noble and sublime decision has not gone without opposition. This opposition has often risen to ominous proportions. Many states have risen up in open defiance, saying that separate but equal is no longer the word, the law of the land. Legislative halls of the South ring with loud words such as interposition and nullification, but even more, all types of conniving methods are still being used to prevent Negroes from becoming registered voters. The denial of this sacred right is as tragic, a tragic betrayal of the highest mandates of our democratic traditions. And so our most urgent request to the President of the United States and every member of Congress is to give us the right to vote. It's 1957. He said, give us the ballot, and we will no longer have to worry the federal government about our basic rights. Give us the ballot. We will no longer plead to the federal government for passage of an anti-lynching law. We will, by the power of our vote, write the law on the statute books of the South and bring an end to the dastardly acts of the hooded perpetrators of violence. Give us the ballot and we will fill our legislative halls with men of goodwill and send to the sacred halls of Congress men who will not sign a Southern manifesto because of their devotion to the manifesto of justice. Give us the ballot and we will place judges on the benches of the South who will do justly and love mercy, and we will place at the head of the Southern state governors who will, who have felt not only the tang of the human, but the glow of the divine. Give us the ballot, and we will quietly and nonviolently, without rancor or bitterness, implement the Supreme Court's decision, May 17, 1954. Give us the ballot. Then, in 1964, Fannie Lou Hamer testifying before the Democratic Convention, not Republican, Democratic Convention, testified to the point that Lyndon Bain Johnson called an impromptu press conference to shut her testimony down, because this is what she was saying. After, part of, after the first Negro had beat, beat until he was exhausted, the state highway patrolman ordered the second Negro to take the blackjack and beat me because the white cop made the Negro prisoners beat me or be beaten themselves. 
The second Negro began to beat and I began to work my feet and the state highway patrolman ordered the first Negro who had beat me to sit on my feet to keep me from working my feet. I began to scream and one white man got up and began to beat me in my head and tell me to hush. One white man, my dress had worked up so high that he walked over and pulled my dress. I pulled my dress down. He pulled it back up and beat me. I was in jail when Mega Evers was murdered, all on the account that I simply wanted to register to vote and become a first class citizen, that's all. And if the Freedom Democratic Party is not seated now at this convention in 1964, she said, I question America. Is this America, the land of the free and the home of the brave, where we have to sleep with our telephones off the hooks because our lives be threatened daily because we want to live as decent human beings in America. That's 64. In 1965, at the end of the Selma to Montgomery march, Dr. King stands again. This is before the passage of the Voting Rights Act. He says, if it may be said of slavery era that the white man took the world and gave the Negro Jesus, then it may be said of the Reconstruction era that the Southern aristocracy took the world and gave the poor white man Jim Crow. He gave him Jim Crow, and when his wrinkled stomach cried out for food, his empty pockets could not provide, he ate Jim Crow, a psychological bird that told him no matter how bad off he was, at least he was a white man better than a black man. He ate Jim Crow, and when his undernourished children cried out for the necessities that his low wages could not provide, he showed them, the rich aristocracy showed poor whites, them Jim Crow signs on the buses and in the stores and the streets and in the public buildings and his children too learned to feed upon Jim Crow, their last outpost of psychological oblivion. Thus, the threat of the free exercise of the ballot by Negroes and white masses forming coalition resulted in the establishment of a segregated society. To keep black and white people from working together they segregated Southern money from poor whites. They segregated Southern moors from rich whites. They segregated Southern churches from Christianity. They segregated Southern minds from honest thinking. And they segregated the Negro from everything. That's what happened when the Negro and white masses of the South threatened to unite. When the poor whites of the South threatened to unite with blacks and build a great society, a society of justice where none would prey upon the weakness of others, a society of plenty where greed and poverty would be done away, a society of brotherhood where every man would respect the dignity and worth of the human personality, they always sowed division to keep black and white people from voting together. And then later on that summer, Lyndon Baines Johnson goes to Congress and says that Selma and what happened in Selma cannot be ignored. And listen what he says, this is 65 later on. He says, Lyndon Baines Johnson, the issue of equal rights for American Negroes is such an issue. And, we, and, and should we defeat every enemy, and should we double our wealth and conquer the stars as a nation, and still be unequal to this issue, then we will have failed as a people and a nation. This is no Negro problem, there is no Southern problem, there is no Northern problem, there is only an American problem. And we are met here tonight as Americans, not as Democrats or Republicans, we are met here as Americans to solve that problem. This was the first nation in the history of the world to be founded with a purpose. The great phrases of that purpose were sound in every American's heart, North and South, all men are created equal government by the consent of the governed. Give me your liberty or give me death. Well, those are not just clever words or those are not just empty theories. In their name, Americans have fought and died for two centuries. And tonight around the world, they stand there as guardians of our liberty, risking their lives. These words are a promise to every citizen that he shall share in the dignity of man the dignity cannot be found in a man's possessions. It cannot be found in his power of his position. It rests on his right to be treated as a man equal in opportunity to all others. To apply any other test 
To deny a man his hopes because of his color or his race, his religion or the place of his birth is not only to do injustice, it is to deny America and to dishonor the dead who gave their lives for American freedom. He then said, about this there can be and should be no argument. Every American citizen must have an equal right to vote. There is no reason which can excuse the denial of that right. There is no duty which weighs more heavily on us than the duty we have to ensure that right. Yet the harsh fact is that in many places in this country, men and women are kept from voting simply because they are Negroes. Every device of which human ingenuity is capable has been used and continues to be used to deny this right. The Negro citizen may go to register only to be told that, day, that the day is wrong or the hour is late, or the official in charge is absent. And if he persists, and if he manages to present himself to the registrar, he may be disqualified because he did not spell out his middle name or because he abbreviated a word on the application. And if he manages to fill out the application, he's given a test. And, he, and even a college degree held by a Negro cannot be used to prove that he can read a white. For this fact, and for the fact that this is happening, we must pass this piece of legislation. It is our duty, it is our duty. We must overcome this systemic discrimination. The Constitution says that no person shall be kept from voting because of his race or his color. We have sworn it before God and sworn to defend the Constitution. Now, I will send to Congress a law designed to eliminate these illegal barriers. I will send it to Congress and I expect you to act on it. This bill will establish a simple, uniform standard which cannot be used, however ingenious, the effort to flout our Constitution. This legislation will ensure that properly registered individuals are not prohibited from voting. Then he said, there is no constitutional here. The command of the Constitution is plain. There is no moral issue here. It is wrong, it is deadly wrong to deny any of our, your fellow Americans the right to vote in this country. There is no issue of states' rights or national rights. There is only the struggle for human rights. Now, the last time a president sent a civil rights bill to the Congress, it contained, I want you to hear this, it contained, this is the 1964 Civil Rights Act he's talking about, it contained a provision to perfect, protect voting rights in the federal election. The Civil Rights Bill was passed after eight months of debate. And when that bill came back from Congress, the compromise had cut the heart of the voting provision out. Be careful of these people who are always talking about we want to compromise on legislation. This time, there must be no delay, no hesitation, no compromise with our purpose. We cannot wait another eight months. We've already, this is Johnson, we've already waited a hundred years and more. It's time for us to stop wait, waiting. And in that same speech he said, and we shall overcome. However, while that was going on, Ronald Reagan was running and Reagan opposed the Civil Rights Act of 1964 opposed the Voting Rights Act of 1965, and Reagan said it humiliated the South. And when Reagan ran for governor of California in 1966, one year after the passage of the Voting Rights Act, he promised to wipe the Fair Housing Act off the books and said as a governor in 1966, if an individual wants to discriminate against Negroes or anybody else in selling or rent renting his house, he has a right to do so. And after the Republican Convention of 1980, Reagan traveled to the county fair of Neshobo, Mississippi, where in 1964, three Freedom Riders had been slain by the Ku Klux Klan, Swanner, Chain, and Goodman. Before an all-white crowd of tens of thousands, Reagan declared, I believe in states' rights. In 2013, Justice Roberts said, because of all the people that are registered to vote and the great participation that we have now, we don't need the protections of the Voting Rights Act anymore because the registrations and voter participation proves that there are no barriers. But Justice Ginsburg said in that same year, hubris is a fit word 
for what this court has done today to the Voting Rights Act. She said on June 25, 2013, it's like throwing out, throwing out preclearance, the Section 4 formula that determines which states have to get their laws pre-cleared because for years they have proven that they can't be trusted. She said to throw it out when it has worked and is continuing to work to stop discriminatory changes is like throwing away your umbrella in a rainstorm because you're not getting wet. <laughs> then she talked about Bloody Sunday. Then she quoted Dr. Martin Luther King and said, no matter what this, this, co this court does today, the arc of the Mar universe is long and it bends toward justice. And then Ginsburg quoted Shakespeare and told the court, what is past is prologue. And then she quoted the Spanish-American poet and philosopher George Santianta, who said, those who cannot remember the past are continued, condemned to repeat it. In Hebrew, the word for voice and the word for vo vo vote are the same word, koil. The rabbis taught me that. They said, in Hebrew, Q-O-L, as it would be spelled in English, koil, is voice and the same word we would use to say vote. And yet we stand here today in the 400th year since slaves were brought here, 149 years since the 15th Amendment of the Voting Right, uh, the 15th Amendment of the Constitution protecting the right to vote was passed. All these years since 1965 and the Voting Rights Act was passed. And since June 25th, 2013, for 2,051 days, the Congress of these United States has refused to fix the Voting Rights Act. Think about that for a moment. Strom Thurmond, whom we call historically a racist, only filibustered the 1957 Civil Rights Act for one day. This current Congress and the leadership of the Congress in the Senate and the House since 2013 has engaged in modern day interposition and nullification and blocked fixing the Voting Rights Act and protecting the voting rights of black people, brown people, native people, and women, and all Americans really, for over 2,051 days. Rhetorically, I ask if Strom Thurmond was a racist, for blocking the Civil Rights Act for one day, then what is it that we have to call leaders who have literally blocked fixing the Voting Rights Act for 2,051 days today? Because today, more than 50 years after the Voting Rights Act, people of color still experience a broad range of attacks on their voting rights, including racialized redistricting, voter ID laws, proof of citizenship, voter restriction hurdles, reduction of days for early and absentee voting, felony disenfranchisement, purging of voter rolls, preemption laws, and emergency financial ma manager opportunities, which goes in and appoints people to control cities and those budgets that the people did not elect. And while racialized voter suppression tactics have continued to operate it in the post-Civil War era, their dramatic rise in the last 10 years has curtailed the democratic freedoms of millions in the USA. Despite an overwhelming lack of evidence, policymakers have successfully pushed the myth of widespread voter fraud into the political discourse. In the 21st century, voter suppression laws have become increase an increasingly popular strategy for restricting voting blocks that feature large numbers of voters of color and the poor, creating barriers to voting along race and class lines. In the 21st century, this is not about left versus right. It's about right versus wrong. According to the Electoral Integrity Project, partisan redistricting and gerrymandering, and by the way, gerrymandering first began up here. You all sent that down south because gerrymandering was first used against the Polish and the Irish and others who were not considered true white Anglo-Saxons. That's, that's where it was first in the North. 
gerrymandering was created by someone out of Massachusetts. His last name was Jerry, and it, and it drew lines that looked like a salamander because they call it gerrymandering. In May, excuse me, the Electoral Integrity Project, pro project says that redistricting and racialized gerrymandering were the greatest threat to fair elections in the United States in 2016, not, not Russia. One of the greatest problems we face now is we've been spending all these years talking about Russia, and we don't know exactly what Russia did, but we know what voter suppression does. In May 2017, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled on the racially discriminatory intent of voter suppression laws, refusing to revive a North Carolina election law that the Fourth Circuit Court appeals found. Now listen, to this. this is what was found in the 21st century just about a year and a half ago. The courts ruled, the courts now, even the Roberts Court had to agree that what was done in North Carolina, let me read exactly from the, the decision, targeted African Americans with almost surgical precision. Let me, let me translate that at, at, at the street level. <laughs> the goal of surgery is to remove what you want to move, but leave the least amount of a scar. So they're saying that these legislators targeted African Americans and were trying to do it in such a way that nobody would catch them and realize what they had done. The court found that the following parts of the North Carolina law disproportionately affected black people. What did they do? They, the legislature, when they got power, they shortened early voting from 17 days to 10. They put in a strict form of photo ID that would not even allow a, 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 univer a University of North Carolina or North Carolina Central uh, or Duke um, a student ID to be considered valid. They eliminated same-day registration and they even eliminated pre-registration of teenagers. They put a ban on counting votes cast in the wrong precinct and on January 9, 2018, the federal court ordered North Carolina to redraw its districts on the grounds that they demonstrated partisan bias. But the court, but they did all of this without pre-clearance, which meant the laws that they passed that the courts found discriminatory went into effect without having to be pre-cleared by the Justice Department, which meant for a couple of, of elections, we actually used unconstitutional laws to elect people, which means in North Carolina and several other places around the con country, we have unconstitutionally constituted legislators making decisions in the 21st century. Recent court battles over district lines in Native American communities further highlight the process of racialized voter suppression. At least 17 states in 2016 had cases brought to litigation or tribal diplomacy involving voter suppression that targeted Native Americans and or Alaskan Native voters. This is happening right now. In some instances, Native American voters have had to travel an average of two hours to submit a ballot without access to reliable public transportation. In total, the Brennan Center for Justice has reported that 23 states adopted various forms of voter suppression laws since 2010. Hear what I'm saying? The problems we have in now didn't start in 2016. Since 2010, 23 states, that's almost half of the 50 states in the, in, in the United States, passed various forms of voter suppression laws, even though Lyndon Baines Johnson said in 1965, we must eliminate any way that humans can use their ingenuity to deny the right to vote. In, in those 23 states, it included 13 had restrictive photo ID laws, six with strict photo ID requirements, 11 with laws making it harder to register, six with reduced early voting days and hours, and three that made it harder to restore voting rights for people with past criminal convictions. Between 2001 and 2012, guess how many restrictive voter IDs were introduced into state legislatures? Somebody guess. Between 2001 and 2012, 
Give me a number. 100. Give me a number. 200. 75. 910. 910 times legislatures submitted bills to try to stop people from voting in a democracy. Then in 2013, after the Shelby decision, this was before Shelby, the Supreme Court struck down the key vision of the Voting Rights Act. And by the way, let me say this about the Shelby decision. When people said they didn't like pre-clean, did you know that all a state had to do to be removed from pre-clearance was to stop discriminating for 10 years. <laughs> Since August 6, 1965, all your state had to do was not discriminate for 10 years and you could be removed from preclearance and pass any laws you want to. And not one state that was under preclearance, even parts of New York, could resist. In 2015, a national study found this, states with a high turnout of voters of color in the previous presidential election were on average expected to see more than three additional restrictive proposals every two years. In other words, the whole issue of voter fraud wasn't an issue until, until black folk and brown folk started voting above 60% and joining with progressive whites. Every state that had a high turnout of voters of color, a study showed that for the next two years, they would get at least three restrictive proposals. A University of California, San Diego study looked at the most common voter suppression tactic, photo ID laws, and found that they doubled the turnout gap between whites and Latinx people in general election and nearly doubled the white-black turnout gap in primaries. This is surgical. Intended. There was a legislature, legislator in Pennsylvania that was actually caught on camera, on tape, saying, we've got it done, and we know it will suppress so much of the vote. By 2016, 14 states had new voting restrictions in place for the first time. After 2013, 14 states passed voters, new voter restrictions because, as one guy said in our state, he said, the day that the Supreme Court ruled that preclearance was nullified, this senator actually said, now that the headache has been removed. Alabama, Arizona, Indiana, Kansas, Mississippi, Nebraska, New Hampshire, Ohio, Rhode Island, South Carolina, Tennessee, Texas, Virginia, and Wisconsin all passed voter restriction after the Shelby decision. Notice all of those states weren't in the South either. These steps disproportionately targeted low-income residents and neighborhoods of color. When including felony voter disenfranchisement, eight out of the 10 poorest states have enacted voter suppression laws. And only recently saw such laws overturned in federal court. Since 1968, the number of disenfranchised voters has tripled from 2 million to 6.1 million Americans. Since 1968, in the last 50 years, including one in 13 black adults in four states, Florida, Kentucky, Virginia, and Tennessee, more than one in five black adults cannot vote. And nationally, 13% of all black men have been denied the right to vote. As the Center for American Progress reports, the political barriers that previously incarcerated black men and women face, go hand in hand with barriers to employment, to housing, to public assistance, and education. Voter suppression at the state level is also accompanied by economic suppression. Now watch this. The 13 states that passed voter suppression laws also opted not to accept Medicaid expansion. So the very people that get elected through racialized voter suppression, once they get elected, they block policies or pass policies that hurt mostly white people. Because the majority of the people who are poor in this country are white. Raw numbers, 
fact, 30 million more than blacks, not in terms of percentage of race, but in terms of raw number. The majority of the people that were covered by the Affordable Care Act, that some want to call Obamacare as a form of way of racializing, were white and poor whites. And the poorest states that pass voter suppression laws then turn around and block Medicaid expansion, denying support to millions of people. My sister, Caitlin Swain, a civil rights attorney who challenged the North Carolina voter suppression law, has quoted me saying this. The same, listen to this. The same states that have the worst voter suppression laws are, host, are also the states that have the greatest denial of health care, the greatest denial of living wages, the highest rates of incarceration, and the greatest attacks on immigrants. So if all you knew was that a state was a voter suppression state, you can almost surmise, you can, hypoth you can hypothesize that that state is also a poor state with the lack of living wages, the lack of health care, attacks on immigrants. Oh, and the same states that are high voter suppression states are also states that attack the LGBT community the highest. So voter suppression is not just a black issue. It is, in fact, an American issue. The same states that have the highest voter suppression are also the states that have the worst protections for the environment. Wherever there's voter suppression, wherever there is this sense that you have to suppress the right to vote, because theologically, can I work a little bit, theologically, we only give the right to vote to people. We don't give the right to vote to puppies, parakeets, and pets. Watch me now do a little systematic theology. So if you deny the right to vote or suppress the right to vote to somebody else, then you are suppressing the imago dei in them. You have to, because we only give the right to people. Persons who are 18 years old, born or naturalized in these United States. So to suppress the vote, is to, in essence, say, you're not a person. You, 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 you're not a person. You, you, you can't have any say in this democracy. And once you say that about voting, you can say the same thing. Well, you don't need health care either. You don't need living wage either. Voter suppression is based on the lie of racism and voter fraud. Grandmama used to say, scratch a liar, find a thief. Dr. King said, every time there's the potential in America for black poor folk and white poor folk to come together and create bloating, voting blocks in mass, there is always the sowing of division so that the aristocracy and the greedy can control the vote and thereby have access to the coffers of, Ameri of the American government, i.e., the tax dollars. And New York is not alone. New York doesn't have same day registration, early voting. So don't y'all sit up here and look at me because I'm from the South. 54% of all African American voters live in states that are suppressed to vote. If you can suppress the 13 former Confederate states, if you suppress the votes there from, from, Virgi from Virginia on over to Texas, if you can suppress those votes and control that, that block of voting, you control over 170 electoral votes, which means you only need about 99 from the other 37 states. You can control 30% of the United States House of Representatives and 26 members of the United States Senate, which means you only need 25 senators from the other 37 states in order to control the Senate. However, 2018 gave us the opportunity to see the potential of new fusion coalitions at work at places where few people believed they were possible. And 2018 showed us the power of the vote and why some extremists are working so hard to suppress it. In my home state of North Carolina, we have voted under illegal gerrymandering maps since 2012. Though the federal government ruled that it was too late to redraw the congressional districts in 218, we did have newly drawn state legislative districts. And under these new maps, the same coalition that sent the only Republican governor in the country home, and we didn't send him home because he was Republican, we sent him home because he was an extremist, 
because he was against voting rights. He wouldn't expand health care for 500,000 North Carolinians, 346,000 which were white, 150,000 which were black. Not only that, in 2016, we broke the extremist supermajorities in both chambers of the State House, and we added an African American woman with a strong history of voting rights advocacy to the State Supreme Court because we finally got something fairer in terms of redistricting. We were able to, to overturn those racist gerrymandering districts. And now we're waiting on the congressional districts. This demonstration of a new voting coalition cast doubt on the so-called red state myth of the solid South. The South is not red, it's unorganized and voter suppressed. <laughs> Stacey Abrams in Georgia. Andrew Gillum in Florida each ran statewide races in the South that demonstrate the power of black, white, and brown voters to match the established political machines in their states across the South. And though they quote unquote lost, they didn't lose because they lost because of voter suppression. Just like in 2016, I'm not, whoever you voted for, you at least need to know that, that the current occupant of the president is president, not because he got a majority of the vote, but because of 80,000 votes in three states, and one of them was Wisconsin. He won by 30,000 votes in Wisconsin. There were 250,000 votes suppressed in Wisconsin. That's fact. Nearly four million more people voted against the current occupant. However you feel about that, these are the facts. We've only had three instances that I know of in history where somebody who didn't win the popular vote was, was selected by the Electoral College, which, in it, which also is a racist policy that grows out of the three-fifths compromise, but, but only three times, 1877, 2000 with Bush, 2016 with, with Trump, and you can read the record for yourself, they all turned out bad. Whenever we put some, I'm just saying, it's just history. Whenever we put somebody in who did not get both the popular vote and the Electoral College, whether it was Rutherford B. Hayes and what he did with the Hayes Compromise, what happened in 2000 and what's happening now. But, but Stacey Adam, Abrams and, and Andrew Gillum showed us, and, and they showed us what could happen, but because of voter suppression. You know, some people are calling now for the governor of Virginia to resign because of some pictures from 84. And I've said to folks, they asked me, well, I said, well, I really don't have an opinion on that. I mean, I, that's up to them. What he said, what he, if he's, that's him, it's gross, it's ugly. But if we're going to have people resign for racism, <laughs> I'm just saying, if, that, if that's the standard, I'm ready for that now. Because the first one I want to resign is the governor of Georgia, who, when he was Secretary of State, engaged in racist voter suppression. I want him to come right on down the line, get Scott out of the Senate, because he pushed voter suppression in Florida. Get Tom Tillis in the Senate, who was the author of the voter, monster voter law that the Supreme Court ruled was targeted racism. We are going to have to start dealing with racism for real, for real. Not just symbolic cultural racism, but systemic and policy and legal racism. Even in Mississippi, we saw something this year. Thad Cochran had won his Senate seat by 20 points in 2012. A new coalition got together, African Americans, whites and Latinos, Mike Epsi, not only did he come close, he closed the gap by eight points, and he almost would have won if he could have got full help, and if progressives really believe that you can win in Mississippi, that it's a new day, and he's already announced that he's going to run again in 2020. Far too long, as I close, Americans have accepted the narrative of a conservative, solid South made up of red states that a certain party can assume in national election. President, current president loves to point to maps of a congressional district that show a scarlet swath across the former slaveholding state with a few clusters of blue around our largest metropolitan area. But these maps are an optical illusion created by gerrymanders that have stacked and cracked voters who object to extremism in a few districts. They win by incredibly high margin, thus diluting their impact on neighboring districts. Among registered active voters, southern states are now more purple than red, if you want to use the colors, 
Republicans who control boards of election across the South know this, and they have consistently engaged in voter suppression tactics to maintain political control. In 2018, voter suppression in Florida and Georgia were widely reported in the national news for the first time. But these tactics are not new. They've been used across the South, especially since the Supreme Court Shelby decision gutted the Voting Rights Act in 2013. We have to challenge this. That's why Stacey Abrams refused to concede defeat in the Georgia gubernatorial race. She highlighted the role that voter purges and restrictive ID requirements and inadequate equipment and provisional ballots played in suppressing the votes of poor black and brown and poor white people. Because Abrams knows the power of the new fusion coalition in Georgia because she's worked for the past decades to build it. And she knows how hard Brian Kemp worked to use his office as Secretary of State to keep people from voting who were likely opposed to him. If these fusion coalitions weren't powerful, this is it. If fusion coalitions weren't powerful and if voting wasn't powerful, then extremists would be spending so much money to restrict. Hmm? They wouldn't be spending so money to push photo ID and voter purges and gerrymandering in court. In North Carolina, the popular vote, listen, the popular vote in North Carolina this year for congressional seats was 50-50. But the extremists who, who have hijacked the Republican Party maintain nine seats, nine, maybe 10, of our 13 congressional seats because of gerrymandering. The voting was 50-50. But the representation is like 70-30. That's what's happening. Since 2010, we've seen this assault on voting rights. We've seen this assault. And so we end up hurting the poor, black, brown, and, and white, native. We have unconstitutionally constituted legislators and congresspersons. One candidate wins by more than three million votes but loses. <laughs> That's not a democracy. You're automatically registered to vote, register for war, but you're not registered automatically to vote. A country of immigrants attack immigrants and say clearly that the reason many people don't want immigrants because they do not want the voting part demographics to change. Now we have a suggestion of having a race, racist merit-based system to allow people in the country. That's not what she said on, in the, on, that's not, it's a give me. You're tired, you're poor, you're huddled masses, yearn. Give me these. It didn't say if they have a certain merit, because if you're going to go back to merit base, you're going to have to go back in our history and expel some people. Because <laughs> their great grandmamas and granddaddies couldn't have got in based on the merit they want to. That, that is nothing more than trying to limit this democracy. The wall isn't about border security, it's about identity. It's about the potential of an electorate in which extremists who do not welcome black, brown, and white, who only see in terms of white nationalism, are afraid that their majority will be overridden. So in this moment, part of what we have to do is help America face the question, what is it, what myth causes so many poor whites to still resist coalitions with brown and black folk? What makes many poor working caste whites vote for a candidate who promises, if you elect me, I'll take your health care. If you elect me, I won't pay you a living wage. What myth will make you vote? What's so powerful that it keeps working class people of all races from coming together and building a multiracial coalition? That's the myth we must take on. Because there are forces that fear the possibility in the South and in the nation. Demographics are shifting. The new data shows us that a progressive future is headed to the South and to the, and to the breadbasket. And despite the actions of the extremists, we can make it come faster. The South is at a moment of great demographic change thanks to African-American remigration and Latino and Asian immigration. The population of people of color in the South has exploded in recent years. From 2000 to 2010, the non-Hispanic white population grew at a rate of 4%, while the so-called minority population grew by 34%. In 2000, the South was 34.2% people of color. That number has jumped to 40% by 2010. And extremists who do not want this diversity are aware of these facts, and they are intimidated by them. They understand that African Americans for some time now have been the backbone of progressive vote in the United States. If you connect them with progressive whites and you pr pr uh, connect them with brown people, 
we have the possibility of having the strongest, most powerful in some ways, liberal democracy in the world that will be influenced primarily by progressive whites, black people and brown people. They know that states like South Carolina, Georgia, North Carolina, Mississippi, and Virginia are ripe for change. We've seen it. Georgia, we've seen it in Mississippi. The southern states and many others are not red states. They're not blue states. They're unorganized, undermobilized states. And the poor, the 140 million poor people in this country hold the key to the transformation of this democracy. The 100 million people that didn't even vote the last time because they never hear themselves in the debates. They only hear middle class and wealthy. They don't hear the poor. If we register right now 30% of all the unregistered black voters in the South and connect them with progressive whites and brown people, you can change five southern states right now. If you change those five southern states, you change American politics in this country. And there are extremists that know it, that do not want rooms that look like this to show up at the polls and vote together. So what must we do? We must demand the immediate full restoration and expansion of the Voting Rights Act and end to racist gerrymandering and redistricting. And we must demand early registration of 17-year-olds and the implementation of automatic registration to vote at the age of 18 and early voting in every state and same-day registration and the enactment of Election Day as a holiday and a viable paper record so we won't, keep, we won't get these glitches in these, in these machines. We demand the reversal of state laws that preempt local government from passing minimum wage increases and the removal of emergency financial management positions that are unaccountable to the democratic process. We de must demand an end to placing persons on the federal bench who have a record of standing against voting rights. We demand statehood and voting rights and representation for the more than 690,000 people in Washington, D.C. We must demand a clear and just immigration system that strengthens our democracy through the broad participation of everyone in this country, that includes a providing a timely citizenship process that guarantees the right to vote. It also requires protecting immigrants' ability to organize for their rights in the workplace and to be a part of labor union. And we must demand that First Nations and Native American and Alaska Native people retain their tribal recognition as nation, not racist, to make substantive claims to their sovereignty and that nothing be done to block their right to vote. Why must we do this? Because the heart of our democracy is at stake. This issue is not Republican or Democrat. It is not conservative or liberal. It is not left versus right. It is right versus wrong. And as old as the scriptures of Isaiah that are honored by Catholics, that are honored by Protestants, that's honored by Muslims and Jews, the prophet told us long time ago a warning to nation. In Isaiah 10, the prophet said, woe unto those who legislate evil and rob the poor of their right and make women and children their prey. We must stop those who would dare rob our democracy. And it must begin with an all out fight, all of us, to protect the fundamental right to vote in this country with no exceptions, no exception. We cannot give up on this right to vote. We will give no quarter when it comes to fighting for the right to vote. The right to vote is non-negotiable. That must be our demand.